Welcome to a new podcast episode of Radiology AI. My name is Dania Day, and I'm the Associate Editor for Social Media for Radiology AI. And today, my co-host Polly and I are very excited to bring a new episode of the podcast series. Today, we will be interviewing Dr. Despina Contos, and we'll be hearing from her about her journey in imaging and AI and her vision for the future. Dr. Contos, thank you for joining us today. First, I'll start with a brief introduction. Dr. Contos is the Matthew J. Wilson Associate Professor of Research Radiology and the Associate Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Radiology at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She received a Bachelor's in Computer Engineering and Informatics from the University of Patras in Greece, a Master's in Computer and Information Sciences from Temple University in Philadelphia, as well as a PhD in Computer and Information Sciences from Temple University. She then pursued postgraduate training as a research fellow in basic radiological sciences at the University of Pennsylvania from 2006 to 2008. Dr. Prontos was also a fellow in radiology, physics, and breast imaging through the Susan G. Komen for the Cure Foundation. Dr. Contos is a computer scientist by training with a research focus on machine learning applications for multimodality cancer imaging. She specifically focuses on investigating the role of imaging as a biomarker for personalized cancer screening, prognostication, and therapy response assessment, primarily for breast and most recently lung cancer. Dr. Contos is also Deputy Editor for Radiology Artificial Intelligence. Dr. Contos, thank you for joining us today. I will turn it over to my co-host, Paul, for the interview. Danya, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Paul Yi, and I'm an assistant professor of radiology at the University of Maryland. And it's my distinct pleasure to have Dr. Despina Contos here with us on the Radiology AI podcast. Thanks so much, Despina, for joining us on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me. Such a pleasure. Such a pleasure to join you today. So many of us in radiology have gotten interested in AI relatively recently, uh, particularly with the surge in popularity of deep learning over the past few years. But you've actually been researching machine learning and medical imaging long before this. Can you tell us and share with us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in AI for medical imaging? Sure. So, you know, if you really want to go back to the origins and in some way, uh, I would go back all the way up growing up. So I grew up in a different country. I grew up in Greece. And during my school years, I was equally drawn to medicine and engineering. Uh, you know, it turns out my mom's a medical doctor. My dad is a mathematician, computer science. I kind of fell right in between. And I was always kind of in the middle. Do I want to go to medical school? Do I want to go to engineering? And that, what really kind of pushed me a little bit over the edge was like, I, at that time, little did I know, I thought that if I went to medical school, I'd be in school forever. So then I said, I just go to engineering, I'll be done quicker, I'll have a good job, live, you know, live, live the life in Greece, you know, beautiful islands, you know, who wants to be in school forever. But then um, as part of, you know, going to school in engineering, when I was done with undergrad, I realized how much I missed learning new things. An opportunity came up for me to pursue graduate work abroad here in the US. I, I went to Temple in Philadelphia, Temple University and did a computer science degree. And then uh, during that time, I ended up, uh, my advisor had a collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania on a project of using image processing techniques to analyze uh, mammograms. And sort of, first of all, I mean, during that time, a lot of things in my life had happened kind of circumstantially. It was the first time that I really felt through doing research that sort of this is what I want to do when I grow up. Like, not just because things had happened, just because really I felt a calling for what I wanted to do. And so through that collaboration where we were using sort of image processing and computer science techniques to analyze uh, mammograms at the time, I kind of felt like things were coming together. My passion for medicine, you know, that was always there. And my, uh, you know, my, my curiosity and my natural incline towards engineering and math and the sciences sort of came together. And, and when I graduated, you know, a lot, Usually when you graduate computer science department, and engineering departments, the, the, the path is to, to go and teach at a more of a, like a school of engineering. I felt that, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to go to school of to medical school because I think there's great opportunity to apply a lot of these techniques. And that's sort of what I first learned about, you know, neural networks and AI, you know, years and years ago in, in my undergrad and my graduate work. And I said, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to take this tool and take them to the clinic because, for example, you know, in the literature at the time, we had so many sort of like image segmentation techniques and image registration techniques and whatnot. 
But when it came to like clinical standards, even now, for example, resist, right? It's a very manual visual standard. And if I'm doing resist criteria in one patient versus if you're doing resist criteria to another to a patient, they might end up with a different treatment just because we outlined the longest diameter in a different way manually, right? And so I felt like, you know what? There's a lot of opportunity there. And so it felt, you know, for, for, the, for the engineering world, going to a, a medical school, it feels more like not as a safe job because you're depending on like what they call soft money and grant funding and rather than more conventional teaching. Um, but I was like, you know what? This is what I really want to do in my life. I want to I wanna put these two passions that I've always, you know, uh, had together, like med- medicine with engineering and put all these tools that I've learned about, like neural networks and machine learning into good use so we can help do something better uh, for patients and in medicine. And so I've always been drawn in, in, in the fusion of engineering with medicine. And uh, we've been doing that, as you said, for many, many years. And uh, it's kind of exciting to see that we're finally sort of prime time. <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing all that. That's, that's super interesting. Um... I think we're uh, really lucky that you decided to go for the uh, path that might not be as secure as some other paths. Um, And one thing that you noted is that we're in prime time now for AI and deep learning. And as uh, many of our listeners know, uh, deep learning really took off in 2012 when AlexNet was uh, one of the winners Mm -hmm. or was the winner of the ImageNet um, Visual Recognition Challenge. But I think it's really interesting to think that long before that, people like yourself had known about neural networks. um, I think some other people we've had on the podcast, like Dr. Kurt Langlotz and um, uh, Dr. Brad Erickson also worked on neural networks before we had GPUs. And I just want to point out that um, there's been a lot of fascinating work done in radiology long before 2012 for things like image segmentation, let's say breast Mm -hmm. parenchymal segmentation, volume estimation, including by groups like yours, using other types of machine learning techniques like fuzzy seeming segmentation. But incidentally, your group has also recently published work in deep learning in the uh, so-called prime time now. So I'm curious, what has your experience been like navigating these different waves of AI techniques over the years? And do you think there's still a role for some of these techniques that came before 2012, before the current state of neural networks? You know, that's a a very good question. And and sometimes I joke a little bit about the the waves of AI. I kind of feel like they're a little bit like the waves of COVID. You know, you, you know, they're going to go up, you know, they're going to go down, but you also know it's going to stick around, like it's not going anywhere. So, um, so as you said, I think there's definitely a place for both and, and more traditional sort of machine learning techniques and, and handcrafted features and AI and, and, and deep learning. And again, neural networks have been around forever. The first neural network book I read was my undergrad degree in Greece, right, way back in the day. What's changed? Well, what's changed is now we have the hardware power to actually scale that up. And, and basically, that's what deep learning is. Neural networks on steroids in some, in some way, right? So we, we didn't have the means to do that in the past. We couldn't computationally um, uh, implement these architectures in a way that made sense, and it was tractable and doable. And now we do. You know, same thing in, in all other kinds of uh, disciplines, right? Remember how big your first cell phone was like my first cell phone was as big as a shoe right and now they're teeny tiny and they have as much computational power maybe as in traditional like laptop old laptop or something so technology is evolving especially in hardware and this gives us the advantage to do a lot of these new techniques including implement deep learning and and scale it up in ways that we've never done before i think there these techniques have certain advantages Uh, for example they definitely have I think an advantage over more traditional methods in tasks such as segmentation, they're more robust to noise, fluctuations, uh, and, and imaging acquisition parameters and things like that. I think there are also opportunities in some a little bit more traditional ways or image reconstruction, um, even instrumentation, workflow improvement. And in my view, I think these tools have also a lot of potential in hypothesis generation not just hypothesis testing, not just like predicting things or segmenting things, but letting these tools tell us what patterns they see in the data and learn from that. So we can go back to the drawing board and let's say find biological mechanisms. So for example, you mentioned about parenchymal pattern segmentation, volume density estimation, breast cancer risk assessment is an area of application, right? If we let, for example, you know, a neural network try to tell us what is in the pattern of the breast 
what makes a woman be at a high risk of developing breast cancer. We don't just have a tool that can predict that, which is great, but maybe we can go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what does it mean with respect to the underlying biology? What do the structures mean? Are they related to the fat content in the breast? Are they related to the epithelium? Are they related to any specific structures? Can we intervene? Are there any mechanisms that we can intervene uh, either with, with novel uh, therapeutics or lifestyle interventions or changes that we that can then reduce the risk? So I think that is an area and an opportunity that's a big one. And we shouldn't miss that opportunity just because, you know, we can all get a Alex net from the net and train it to predict something. And it will predict that something with a certain degree of accuracy. We need to be mindful to not get into the culture of like the black boxes and try to harness that power of deep learning to learn from it and, and go back to the drawing board and generate novel hypotheses that then we can go back and, and test mechanistically with, uh, and, and come up with, with ways to improve care. Uh, I still think that certain... Uh, in certain areas, conventional machine learning can be very useful. You know, deep learning has the drawback that requires very large data sets. And a challenge there will always be the annotation, right? How you get like, for example, segmentation, truth labels, right? Uh, manual segmentation, so what, or whatever. And so not in, not in all clinical settings, we have this huge large data sets that are suitable for uh, reliable training of deep learning models. And in a lot of settings, also, we have good a priori knowledge of what type of features we're going, we need to go after. And sometimes, you know, more complex doesn't always mean better. Sometimes simple measures can do as well. So we shouldn't sort of forget about all that. I think the future is in some areas that deep learning techniques will continue to give us a better performance. I think tasks such as segmentations are an ideal sort of setting, but there are areas that conventional machine learning techniques and and radiomics, for example, analysis will continue to have incredible uh, uh, value. And ultimately, we need to be thinking how do we fuse both of them and not think of them as a competitors, but as something that can go hand in hand. Yeah, totally. That's um, super interesting. You know, one thing that I, I thought about was as you were talking about how there really needs to be um, thoughtful uses of these various tools, not just using deep learning let's say, as a um, panacea or a one-size-fits-all right. kind of um, tool. One thing that I've always wondered, though, is what is the ideal kind of way to really bring in these complementary expertises? Because I think that right now, I'm a radiologist, and a question that I think a lot of um, trainees have, a lot of my colleagues who are out of training have is, hey, what should I do? Should I be learning to code? If I'm learning to code, should I really get in the nitty-gritty, or should I use you know, some of these prepackaged, you know, kinds of higher level frameworks. Um, but then part of me wonders, well, that's, that's helpful. I think that's useful. But in reality, we're not the experts on this. And then moreover, even if we lump experts into, you know, radiologists and engineers, within engineering, you have people who may be hardcore deep learning computer vision experts in the so-called prime time. But you may have others who have the expertise in more traditional methods. Um, I'm thinking of things like radiomics, which have been around for a long time, where we've seen that there is a lot of pre-existing knowledge. And so I fear that that is something that um, we might not be able to figure out, you know, what's the optimal mix? Is it that, you know, it should be housed in a radiology department, or should there really be an integration of radiology with, let's say, computer science, maybe with biostats, et cetera? So I'm not sure. Um, that's, I don't think there's going to be one uh, right or wrong answer, but I'm wondering what your thoughts might be on that if you were to design something. I'm a big fan of integration and collaborative work, right? So I may, I may have put a lot of time and effort to understand sort of the clinical aspects of this discipline, but I'll never be a radiologist. I'll never be an oncologist and I'll never know the, the implications of taking care of patients the same way as somebody who has had years and years of formal training. Vice versa, right? A radiologist who puts some time and effort to understand a little bit of deep learning will never have the expertise of a person who spent like five, six, seven years doing a PhD in this area, plus postdoctoral research, you know, and all the rest of the stuff. So I think it's it's good for us as experts in in complementary fields to acquire the skills that we can understand each other's quote language to the extent that we can talk to each other in a way that makes sense. But beyond that, I think we need to be encouraging more um, collaboration and integration of different disciplines than 
everyone trying to learn every other discipline so they can do the whole thing by themselves because that's not going to work. In academia, I think there are still some barriers around that. You know, for example, you know, the, the promotion processes and the tenure processes and stuff like that, a lot of them put barriers in that where they, they want, you know, they want investigators to really show that they are sort of leading every effort and or the PIs on every grant, you know, and, and things like that. In my opinion, that may not be the most appropriate way to go forward in order to be able to foster that multidisciplinary environment more and really nurture it, not just you know, foster it, but really nurture that environment and motivate it and incentivize it. And, and I think that's where the future lies, both in terms of how do, we, how do we bring together our expertise, but also how we use these tools, right? You mentioned like, what's the best use of these tools, right? In my opinion, as imaging people, we need to start thinking beyond imaging if we wanna you do the best use of this tool. So I'll give you an example, right? You talked a little bit about the whole like breast density, parenchymal pattern analysis, some of the work we've done in our groups and others. And obviously techniques like deep learning and radiomics have been incredibly valuable in extracting information that can help us inform which women may be at higher risk of breast cancer and, and so forth. The reality is though, you know, no radiologist and no oncologist and no epidemiologists are going to make these um, assessments about risk just on imaging, right? They're going to consider family history. They're going to consider perhaps genetic predispositions, say how many has a BRCA mutation or have moderate penetrance, you know, mutations like SNPs. Maybe somebody has had a very strong family history of, of women in their family diagnosed with breast cancer. So I think the power of these tools will really be harnessed when we start thinking a little bit outside our comfort zone. And our comfort zone is imaging. So outside of imaging, we need to be thinking how to use these tools to put together information that comes from different disciplines to truly be able to implement integrated precision diagnostic. So let's say I have a bunch of radiomics features that are informal on the, on the pattern of the breast. Typically, those features are highly correlated with each other. There may be hundreds, they may be highly correlated with each other. Truly the independent components in that data set may be like a handful, maybe two handfuls, up to 10. I have rarely seen a data set of radiomic features, no matter if there's hundreds of them, when you do a principal component analysis, which is very simple to have more than 10 truly independent components that capture 85% of the variance. I have not seen it so far, and I will be shocked if I see it, right? And then you have folks who come like, you know, from, uh, let's say, for example, the RNA sequencing data or, or, or whole genome sequencing, and they find uh, genetic mutations and whatnot. Again, think about it again as, as variables, right? That's another data set with measurements and variables, could have been radiomics, could be other omics. And then some of these variables may be highly correlated between them, but maybe not as correlated across the imaging data and the genomic data. There may be some patterns of associations. We're not exactly know sure how. And then you have maybe a handful of very important demographic, reproductive, and family history variables. No, those are never going to be in the hundreds. They're going to be a few. If you do the traditional thing of getting all the variables and throwing them into a, a model, it's very likely that the noise in the high dimensional sort of data is going to dominate some of your more important and lower dimensional data set. There's a lot of correlation that may be overfitting, things like that. We need to start thinking about how we can use all these powerful tools to combine this information more intelligently in a way that we can learn how these different types of data correlate with each other and ultimately with patient outcomes. And this is sort of an emerging field of multi-omics integration. I don't think that any single person can do this well, because no matter what background you're coming from, as we discussed earlier, you're not gonna have, the same person is not gonna have a perfect background of combining knowledge of bioinformatics, radiology, epidemiology, like all that stuff. Your core background is probably going to be one of those disciplines and you may have a little bit of extra training in the other disciplines enough to understand, quote, the language. So we need to be coming together as a group of experts, putting a little bit aside perhaps in, you know, like, uh, you know, our academic sort of healthy competition and, and, and start thinking more collaboratively to, to, to really develop some of these tools and, and take them to the next level, which I think could be a fascinating uh, next step for precision medicine. No, totally. I think that's an incredibly, um, incredibly inspiring and exciting vision for not just looking at imaging as an isolated kind of um, input, but integrating it in the vast um, array of data that we have available and really moving towards uh, precision medicine 
course, personalized diagnostics and prognostication, as you're talking about. Um, so at Penn, you direct the Computational Biomarker Imaging Group, or the CBIG, and this is a research group whose stated goal is to act as a translational catalyst between the worlds of computational imaging science and clinical cancer research. So really, as you were saying, bringing together these groups of people for collaboration, for bringing the relative expertises together and creating right. synergy. Can you tell us a little bit about the group and your interests and maybe some of the projects that you're most excited about currently? Exactly. So I, I like that you ask about the, the projects that I'm most excited about because really, you know, and 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 uh, I've, I've been running this group, you know, since I became faculty at Penn a little more than 10 years ago. And it's, you know, always excited to be around smart, young people like, you know, trainees and faculty kind of helps me. Uh, it makes my day, literally, it, it makes my day. And, and part of uh, one of the reasons that I've a bit struggled with the pandemic is because I've lost a little bit of that day-to-day -day interaction, which really kind of feeds and, and nurtures sort of my, my mind and my soul at the same time. And so I, what I'm really excited about are this type of projects, right? Projects that put all that information together, projects that push us a little bit outside our imaging and image processing uh, comfort zone and help us sort of bring together data from multiple sources using uh, AI and machine learning as sort of the, the modeling engine to be able to develop those personalized uh, diagnostics. The group, you know, it's funny because when I first started the group, we had the same acronym, CBIG, but then B stood for breast, computational breast imaging group, because we were just doing just breast. But I thought, well, at some point we may expand a little bit. So the breast could be transformed to biomarker and then we're more, all more uh, encompassing, right? We're, and now more recently, we started working on, on lung cancer, lung cancer as well, thinking of maybe expanding some of the work uh, that we're doing in pancreatic or ovarian cancer moving forward, uh, but definitely staying within, uh, within cancer. And uh, this is exactly the area that makes me excited, like going around outside my comfort zone, building strong collaborations with uh, people outside my uh, expertise. In fact, to learn the language better, you know, over the years, uh, earlier in my career at Penn, I did a, a one and a half a year certificate program in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics to be able to understand how so clinical trials are designed because ultimately if we don't test these tools in the context of clinical trials, ideally randomized clinical trials, um, we're not really putting these biomarkers to the test that every other clinical biomarker is going through. And um, more recently, actually the year right before the pandemic hit us and we all went virtual, uh, I did kind of like a mini, mini time off and I did a one-year program at Harvard Medical School on uh, cancer biology and targeted therapeutics to understand a little bit more about genomics and genetics, and especially in the context of cancer. I'm not by any means an expert in that, in that area, but I feel like I understand the language a little better to be able to go out and see collaborations with people that I feel that could complement uh, our expertise in AI and imaging and help us develop those integrated precision diagnostics uh, tools moving forward. And actually, that's kind of what makes my day, kind of going a little bit out my comfort zone and, and trying to, to think forward, right, about how do, can we take this technology to the next level, how we can make uh, better help with these tools, our clinicians make better decisions about, about patients, especially in cancer care. So shifting gears slightly, um, I want to talk about your uh, some of your roles in the Radiology AI Journal, which I think is another way of doing this kind of interdisciplinary work, since our journal, it's comprised of people who are radiologists, people who are um, engineers by background, and other people in between. So you are deputy editor of the Radiology AI Journal, which is a group of four editors who directly advise and assist Chuck Kahn, our editor-in-chief. Can you talk to us about what that role um, is in more practical terms, and what's your relationship to the other members of the editorial board? Again, that's comprised of radiologists, of engineers, of statisticians, et cetera. Right, right. So this has been an incredible opportunity uh, for me to feel, I feel very lucky to have been invited in the first place uh, by Dr. Khan to join the, uh, uh, the editorial board as a, as a deputy editor. Uh, there are four of us as deputy editors, and uh, in the group. And uh, over the years, I think we have developed a very sort of collegial and, and fun relationship. We have uh, a weekly editorial call in which we discuss pretty much all the papers that are going uh, for revisions. Uh, and we decide if the papers are worth moving forward for revisions. Uh, if we find it to rank within the top 25% 
of the quality of the journals that we that we get. And so the decision of moving something um, for revisions and acceptance is kind of a group decision, um, getting figured out from everybody, making sure we're all on the same page. So we're kind of calibrate to our scoring a little bit. Our responsibilities is to assign uh, reviewers to uh, look at the manuscript, uh, look at the manuscript in the first place and decide if, if it's gonna go for review to begin with. And then if it, if it goes for review, I assign the reviewers with appropriate expertise, um, uh, shepherd the uh, the manuscript through the review process, look at uh, comments, um, decide if we want to bring it up for discussion at the editorial call, and if it's if we feel like it's within that twenty top twenty five percent. I don't know if you ever sort of you know reviewed grant. I, sometimes I feel like it's a mini study section, right? We bring up the paper and we say these are the these are the pros, these are the cons. What do you think? You know, and we decide if the paper moves forward. It's been a it's a, been a great experience. And especially in the beginning, you know, you talked about the waves of the AI when I kind of felt like everybody was riding the AI wave. You know, I think some of us felt a little bit the responsibility, you know, who've been around in this field before it was hot, you know, and trendy um, to try to be a little bit the gatekeepers, not, not in, a, in a bad way, not in a controlling or kind of possessive way, but there was a lot of stuff that comes through. And it's very, very easy for just, you know, to just grab an AlexNet off the shelf and run it through some images and predict something without really understanding the nuance of the data set, the architecture, the novelty, the area of application. Does this make sense? Does it not make sense? That's why Editorial Board, board is, uh, uh, has expertise, both more technical expertise and clinical expertise, because we ideally want the papers to be strong in both areas, to have both a technical novelty, but also have a potential for a impactful clinical application. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting balance to try and keep and decide if the paper can move forward or maybe more appropriate for a more technical journal or more of an applied journal. And uh, again, we're, we're a new journal, so uh, it's been an exciting um, endeavor and we can hope we can continue to contribute to the field in a way that's uh, meaningful to people in our readership. Yeah, totally. Um, on a slightly different uh, angle, I think that Radiology AI has also made efforts to contribute to the field in um, trying to increase representation of historically underrepresented groups in our field. It's no secret that radiology is majority comprised of males, and I think this is probably more true for uh, imaging informatics. But Radiology AI, I know, has made intentional efforts to increase female representation in the editorial boards, both in the general board as well as in the trainee editorial boards, which has been really encouraging for me to see and be part of. Can you comment on your perspectives on the importance of increasing opportunities for women and other represented groups in radiology AI? And are there any initiatives or efforts from the journal or some of the societies that you're involved with that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I think this is a very, very interesting uh, area and an area that I have personally been, you know, very passionate about both in my career, but also in my personal life as well. Um, and I, you know, studies have clearly demonstrated that we have better decision-making process, a better vision, and, and better leadership when we enrich our teams with diversity. Diverse teams end up performing better, they end up making better decisions, they have better leadership vision, and, it's, and, and so it's, it's incredibly uh, important, as you mentioned, you know, to create these opportunities, especially acknowledging some systemic barriers, potentially, to women and minorities uh, uh, assuming roles in, in, in leadership, and um, especially, as you said, in fields like radiology and informatics, they tend to be uh, very sort of historically uh, uh, male-dominated, unfortunately. So I think it's important that we're making a, a conscious effort along these lines. I feel like our uh, um, editorial board is, is very diverse, within, especially even within our small uh, deputy editor team. That was actually one of the reasons that I, I felt very excited to participate as well. And uh, I hope we can, you know, create these opportunities more and more moving forward with our trainee editorial portal as well. I know there's another area that we're very active in terms of making sure we're recruiting members who can represent diversity in its broadest sense. And I hope that um, as community, we can get a little bit more mindful and intentional along these lines. And that's, the, this area is not, an area that people that only in a, at high levels have an opportunity to make a difference and an impact, right? By hiring diverse people, you know, all that stuff. I think it, start, it starts with the change we want to bring 
about as individuals. Because um, that's where the sort of the systemic barriers a lot of the times um, arise from biases, conscious and unconscious most of the time. And what I want to, I want to, I want to believe. And um, those barriers accumulate in a way that um, women and minorities don't end up having similar career opportunities or access to leadership opportunities. And there's a big imbalance in the field, especially as we go towards like the higher ranks. And we need to be mindful how to cultivate um, environments that can embrace uh, diversity in, in its broadest sense in our in our day to day uh, professional and personal lives. I feel very passionate about that as an as an area uh, in my career in my life as well. well. I'm excited to see the fruits of those uh, labors and those efforts in the years to come. As we move into the last few minutes of our time together, I want to ask you a question uh, that we ask all of our guests. What are you most excited about for the next decade in radiology AI? Ooh, that's a loaded question. I think, as I said, uh, what I'm excited about, I guess it's twofold. The first part is I think that this sort of wave of AI has brought more people into this computational field, to people to be more interested in this field, people who weren't necessarily part of this field, either clinicians, to kind of understand and appreciate and this field and the and the value that it may bring to the table. I used to joke. You know, years ago, for example, when you were registered for the RSNA, um, there were all the clinical categories how to register, right? Breast, thoracic, this, that. And then it was like physics and other. If you weren't a clinician, you were either a physicist or an other, right? With time, statistics were added. So you could be a physicist, a statistician, or other. Like for people like me, everybody bundled me in a category of physicist, right? There wasn't even an understanding that this is a separate field. And now we have in every abstract submitted, there's a little checkbox that says, is this work related to AI? And I'm just so excited, right? This, this, this way sort of brought awareness to the field and, and the value that our tools can bring in this discipline and in medicine. And it also brought the interest of a lot of younger people to come to this field, right, and train. And so I think there's a rejuvenation of the field because of that. So that's one part. The second part is obviously for the applications that these technologies will enable. Uh, the multi-omic, multi-data sort of integration, that's what I'm most excited about. I do think eventually, you know, like the, the COVID waves, the AI waves will go a little bit down, but I also think it's gonna stick with us for the long term. It's not going anywhere. Hopefully we won't need to be vaccinated against it, but I think we're good with that. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited both for how um, these technologies enriched and, and broadened the culture of our field, and um, as well as the potential applications that I think we're going to see coming out, especially, I think, in the area of uh, integrated diagnosis. And by the way, I don't think it's going to replace radiologists, right? I think it's kind of like one of the questions that everybody asks an AI person. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, I will quote uh, one of our former uh, chairman in the Department of Radiology at Penn, who said from the very, very, very early days that AI will not replace radiology. That's Dr. Nick Bryan. Uh, but radiologists with AI will replace radiologists without AI. And that I feel very strongly about that this, this will happen. These tools will eventually make it to the clinic. There's also a lot of very, very strong industry interest in this area. And that means we're going to be seeing more and more products coming out. And eventually, um, they're going to be part of the sort of routine workflow everywhere. It might take us, maybe take us a decade to really see everything come through. But I think that this will happen. And uh, it would be very exciting to see these tools in the clinic. All right, Espina, thank you so much for sharing all of your thoughts, your perspectives, and your predictions for the future. I really enjoyed speaking with you and appreciate the time that you've taken with us. Same here. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure talking today, Paul. I appreciate inviting me. And uh, yeah, I look forward to staying in touch. And uh, let's see how my neural network did with these predictions a few years down the road. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so with that, I'll give it back to Tanya. Thank you, Dr. Cortos, for a great discussion, and thank you for sharing with us your journey in imaging and AI and your vision for the future of the field. To our listeners, thank you for tuning in to this podcast episode. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to our Radiology AI podcast series on any of iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. Please stay tuned for our next episode. This has been a production of the RSNA, 
Special thanks to our producer, Kelly Myers, and the rest of the RSNA journal staff.